charge of the electron squared to Planck's constant, divided by Planck's constant times the speed of light, and numerically is 1 over 137. So it's a very small number. And when one tries to understand this, what Schrodinger's equation has to say about the combined system of electromagnetic radiation, which comes from Maxwell's equation, the, the coupling between the two uh, goes through this number, which is very small, so one has to be able to do some kind of perturbation analysis, which is very common in applied mathematics. And the bottom line seems to be that it works. It works very well. And if you, you can calculate it to, in some cases, 12 orders of magnitude accuracy. Now, in order to make it work, however, you have to do something funny. Uh, you keep getting infinity when you do these calculations. You have to throw the infinities away, which amounts to saying that you somehow arbitrarily cut off the theory at very large frequencies or very small uh, wavelengths called uh, uh, lambda. Uh, here I use the word more. <coughs> one over the wavelength. And the Coulomb singularities that appear, because everything is governed by Coulomb forces, the Coulomb singularities, the one over R singularities, have to be smoothed out in order to make sense of everything. But it is supposedly so that the effects of these cutoffs go only as the logarithm of the cutoff, <coughs> and the effect is therefore small. In other words, the effect is almost independent of the very very cutoff because it's only logarithmic. And what people believe is the current view of the world is that there's a superior theory lurking behind all of this called string theory, which is eventually going to tell us how to remove the cutoffs. Right, without having to do anything arbitrary. Now, so this theory, which will eventually emerge, we are told, this, uh, I don't know when, but it's just around the corner, this theory uh, will be the theory of everything. And, uh, actually, to be perfectly honest, people don't quite use that word anymore. It's a little bit too ambitious. It was used at the beginning of string theory, and now people are a little bit too embarrassed they realized they hadn't quite got there yet. But at one time, it was supposed to be the theory of everything. And that, uh, uh, that theory will solve all our problems. So why is there a problem? And I think, well, not, well the problem is the following. I'm myself now adjust it. Yeah. The problem is that uh, atoms and molecules that I will explain about uh, are really <coughs> very low energy physics. That's, that's the, the world we live in. And we know at this, at this level what the theory has to be. It has to be Schrodinger's equation, 1926 plus Maxwell's equation. We know that. And the theory uh, has to either exist or not exist. It, it, it can't have a salvation in some theory, some ultimate <coughs> energy that's way, 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 way beyond anything uh, that we're currently looking at. Uh, but there's more to this than that. Uh, what people uh, <coughs> frequently neglect to point out in physics, oh, sorry, I'm getting this backwards, um, is that is the following fact, that the coupling constant in the theory, which is, as I said, the fine structure constant, which is 1 divided by 137, is not really small. Why is it not small? It's not small because uh, it has to be multiplied by another dimensionless number. And the other dimensionless number is the size of the charge, rather, the electric charge, of a nucleus. Now, the largest atom is the uranium atom, the largest mass atom, and that has a nuclear charge, the units of the electron charge, of 92. That's the 92nd uh, element in the periodic table. 
So what comes in is 92 divided by 137. 92 divided by 137 is not a small number. So in fact, to say that <coughs> the coupling between uh, matter and radiation is small and to be treated perturbatively is wrong. Because the number is not small, even if it could be treated perturbatively. The current view of most physicists who haven't actually tried to do these calculations, if you try this, by the way, you'll realize it's a mess. But uh, physicists will say that it can be done while handled in principle, but at the present time, uh, this is an act of faith. In particular, in the physics literature and in the, the mathematics literature that goes along with it, very little attention has been paid to the many body problem. That is to say, the problem not of one small atom, but the problem of many atoms. And especially the question of the stability of this stability. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. So I'm going to begin now with the quick survey <coughs> a 10 minute course <coughs> in Schrodinger's equation. <coughs> so, what are the stability problems? Well, if I take a, a, an electron which has a negative charge and a nucleus which has a positive charge, the, <coughs> the first question is why doesn't the electron fall into the nucleus? And that problem was uh, presumably answered by uh, Schrodinger's equation, which will come to in a minute. <clears throat> when there are many atoms colliding with each other, why don't we just have chaos? And another way to formulate the question is, since energy uh, is a measure of collapse, that is to say, if you take a positive and negative charge and let them come together, the energy becomes more and more negative. We can formulate the first question by saying that the energy cannot be arbitrarily negative. Now, the answer to this, these questions was given by Schrodinger's quantum mechanics, uh, which, uh, so this is my quick 10 minute introduction to quantum mechanics. Uh, an electron is a point, but it's not represented by a point in R6 state, it's not represented by a point in R6 but rather it's represented by a function. So it takes uh, not six numbers to uh, tell you the state of the electron and position and velocity, but rather infinitely many numbers, a whole function. And <coughs> these functions are normalized, and normalized in L2, with form equal one. And the energy, given the function that represents the electron, is the inner product in L2 of this function with the, uh, a certain differential operator called an Hamiltonian. And we say that the system is stable if this uh, energy is bounded below independent of psi. And that lower bound, which may or may not be an eigenvalue of this operator H, both cases occur, in fact, uh, that law is that a phenomenon is called ground state energy. Now, in order to explain what this differential operator is, some notation is needed. Uh, <coughs> the uh, operator P is just shorthand for I times radius in the right units anyway. And that's supposed to be the momentum. Uh, the electron coordinate is X, and the mass of the electron is M. A nuclear charge, if there's an atom, a nucleus around is uh, C, goes up to 92, and as I already explained, alpha will play a role, that's the uh, fine structure constant. So I'll put this over here. And is that, yeah. Now the focus. Not a lot. Sorry. 
and one wins or the other wins depending on the value of the actual value of the constants in question. Uh, <coughs> sometimes we try to explore supercritical values of Z alpha by banging quad nuclei together, but uh, uh, that's another story. But we can ask the following question. What this tells you is that relativistically that you need a bound on Z alpha. But is there going to be, for some reason or other that we don't foresee, a bound on alpha itself? So far, the only thing that comes in is Z alpha in that, that product. And that's true if you look at an atom. But now suppose you look at more than an atom. So we're, we're still, still with Schrodinger's equation, except we're, we're modifying these things a little bit. So let's look at, let's look at, many body problems. That's the next step. So I want to consider a uh, system with many nuclei which are nailed down in space, located wherever I place them. I will place them at locations ri, and I will go from 1 up to k. So k is the number of nuclei I've got in the world. And let's, for simplicity, suppose that they all have the same value of z. They don't, but let's just simplify the presentation. Then we say that this many-body Hamiltonian is stable. Now, I, I'll tell you, it's sit, written down over here. I'll come to it in a moment. But we say that it's stable if this, the bottom of the spectrum of this thing is bounded below by some constant, some universal constant, times the number of things in the universe, namely the number of nuclei k plus the number of electrons which I'm going to have. So I'm demanding more than that is finite and demanding that it's as a linear lower bound. If I don't have that, I don't have the world as we know it. I don't have some dynamics. I don't have anything. Now, this was, for, oddly enough, this, request, this question was not seriously addressed until 1967. <coughs> Remember, Schrodinger was in 1926, uh, 41 years later. Nobody really bothered to ask this question. This is an absolutely crucial question for, an ask, for understanding whether Schrodinger's mechanics really settles or solves the problem of the stability of matter in the sense that we know it. Uh, because just the finite lower bound is not enough. I also have to know that if I bring two things together, nothing much happens. Maybe there's a little spark or something, but the world doesn't blow up. That's why you need a linear lower bound. Now, the Hamiltonian for this case, I'm back to the non-relativistic case. The Hamiltonian uh, is, first of all, the sum of all the kinetic energy of all the electrons. The nuclei don't have any kinetic energy because they're so terribly massive, they just don't need it. So it's the kinetic energy for all the electrons plus, again, alpha, times the, all the Coulomb interactions, electrical, electrostatic interactions, and what are they? Well, first of all, there's the interaction of the electron at x sub i, the ith one, there are n of them, at, with the nucleus at r sub j. These r's are fixed. And these, these linear lower bounds must be independent of where I fix the nuclei. That's the whole point. Then there's another, oh, it's times z. Another term is the repulsion of the electrons with each other, one over the distance between pairs of electrons, summed over all possible places to the one here because the electron charge is one. And then there's the repulsion of the nuclei. That has a z squared, because the nuclear charge is z. And everything's multiplied by alpha. Now, this operator acts on L2 of R3 n times, because they're n electrons. It's a linear operator. It's a partial differential operator, but it's very complicated. Uh, <coughs> but the rules of quantum mechanics invented by Pauli, by the way, a year before the invention of Schrodinger's mechanics, oddly enough, is that this operator acts on the anti-symmetric uh, functions. That is to say, uh, well, there's this space and spin. Let's
signal is spin. And if you know what it is, that's fine. If you don't, it's not important. It won't play a role in the field. Uh, it acts on anti-symmetric contours only. Remember, in the previous lecture, I talked about bosons where these things act on symmetric functions. Here we're talking about anti-symmetric functions because these are electrons. This fact is the second major element in quantum mechanics. And particles with this property, like electrons, are called bosons. And fortunately, there are no non-decaying bosons in nature. Because if I let this thing act on symmetric functions, I get into the catastrophe. That is to say, as Dyson showed, again in 1967, if I let this thing act on symmetric functions, I get a, a finite lower bound, but the lower bound is not proportional to the number of things, as I demand over here. And <clears throat> what Dyson showed is that this will go, this lower bound will go as the number of things to the seven-fifths power, not the first power, the seven-fifths power, which means that if I bring two collections of things together, I will get an explosion with a release of energy that's as big as the energy in the two things that I bring together. So it's absolutely essential to have the Pauli principle, but given that fact, Dyson and Lenard in 1967 showed that it will be a lower bound, and independent of, I mean, the, the numerical value is a constant dependent on alpha, but there is always one. There's no critical alpha. So that's 1967. This was true somewhat later, but that's not important. Now, let's replace, uh, let's replace this P squared, which is sitting over there, by the corresponding alpha. That's a quick introduction to quantum mechanics, many body problems, and now we try to make it more of this. So I want to replace P squared by P, by the square root of the law of process. And that's horrendous. And that took a long while to figure that one out. Now remember, for a single atom, you get a breakdown of z times alpha is bigger than 2 over pi. But is that correct for this many body? slower. The first person to make any progress with this was, uh, in, the, in the general case, was Joseph Kahneman. That was 84. He showed that it, all the z's are 1, and if alpha is less than 2, 10 to the minus 200, which is quite removed from 1 over 137. Anyway, that was the first case time anybody was able to prove that for general particle on the general end, this thing has a lower bound, and the lower bound is in fact zero, so this is fine. So zero is what's proportional to n. This was improved somewhat by Pfefferman and de la Yave in 86 to this value of 0.16. Again, z equals one. But we're a long way from still from the what we believe to be the correct value. And this was finally done by myself and H. T. Yao. Uh, namely, if all the z alphas are less than 2 over pi, uh, and uh, this is the big and, this is the new feature. Well, the series over here, too. If alpha is less than 1 over 94, then this thing is stable. Otherwise, the bottom of the spectrum is minus infinity. And this is not an artifact of the proof. Uh, this has been improved recently to 0.7, and, but this, this slide is more interesting. If alpha is as big as that number, then this thing is definite with a p, is definitely unstable. The bottom of the spectrum of that is minus infinity. The, 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 the potential energy is three terms in it, a negative term and two positive terms. Those two positive terms, together with the kinetic energy, which is now three, uh, that cannot save the day. The positive terms cannot save the day. The negative terms win, and everything just collapses. So this is not an artifact of that proof. It's a true statement. I mean, we don't know the exact numerical value, but the, the idea is an absolutely correct idea. So for the first time, one sees there are problems.
problems on the horizon. That in order to have uh, quantum mechanics as a stable theory, you need not only that the obvious coupling constant z times alpha is sufficiently small, which that was acceptable or, or known since uh, 19, since the rack, 1927 or so. But what is absolutely new is that you need a bound on alpha itself. So, that is to say, if alpha is as big as that, then no matter how small you make z, small as you like, as long as it's positive, you get collapsed. Or, uh, uh, well, oh, well, this is true. Uh, this is also true. The bosonic matter, that is, if you have bosons, that is, if you don't have the Pauli principle, always collapses. So for finite n, it may or may not collapse depending on the value of alpha. But given alpha positive, any positive number you like, you can find n sufficient, and, and, and z is small as you like, you can always find n sufficiently large so that the thing blows up in your face. Uh, so, without the Pauli principle, the world collapses. Even with the uncertainty principle, or solar wave, or what have you. And even with the positivity of the Coulomb energy, it just collapses. So, quantum mechanics is sort of sitting on a knife edge in a certain sense. You need essentially Sobolev's inequality or the Heisenberg uncertainty principle or something, so that the kinetic energy prevents the potential energy from getting too negative. But you need more than that. You need the Pauli principle. That is, you need the constraint that you're acting only on anti-symmetric functions. And finally, you need that the interaction between the electric energy and the kinetic energy is not too big. That is, alpha if you do it relativistically. If you do it non-relativistically, uh, it doesn't matter. <coughs> Let me just very briefly mention uh, or <coughs> sorry, you know, um, very, very briefly uh, this remark I made about nuclear cells. <coughs> Suppose you do the same thing uh, with a P relativistically, but you do it for a star. That is, you do it for particles interacting gravitationally. So the particles are, let's say, neutrons or, or atoms, it doesn't matter, and they attract each other because it's a gravitational interaction of Newton. So the, the interaction of the potential energy <coughs> minus one over the distance between the particles. They're no nuclei now, they're well over. With no electric forces. This number, kappa, is a very small number. It's about, in the right units, it's about 10 to the minus 38 because gravity is very weak. Now, <coughs> this, so you take this potential energy together with the kinetic energy with the P that I had before, all the particles, and you ask what happens. And this was done by Kondo Sekar in 1931. And in a certain sense, we're going to one of the Nobel Prize, but this is quite an accurate statement, but it's approximately accurate. Uh, and <clears throat> he did this by a, you know, a mean field theory, which means it was not very rigorous. And he concluded that if the number is much bigger than this number kappa to the minus 3 halves, which is about 10 to the 57, this whole thing is just going to the gravitational attraction will win out in the ground state, in the lowest energy state. And the, the bottom of the spectrum will just go to minus infinity. Um, well, let's, let me not explain this. If for bosons, it would be about 1 over kappa. There's a difference between kappa to the minus 3 halves, which is 10 to the 57, and 1 over kappa, which is about the size of the mountain. So if you made a star out of bosons, don't exist stately. But if you did, the size of the star, instead of being the size of the star, would be the size of the star. Uh, but finally, the rigorous justification of all this uh, came uh, <coughs> in 1987 in the work with, with Gell. But I, I just thought I would mention.
mention this because I did say that quantum mechanics shows its head up to sizes of the order of 10 to the 57, and that's what's really happening here. I mean, there are stars, neutron stars, that really sit in their ground state. They don't radiate, well, they, at least not very much, and uh, they answer to the rules of quantum mechanics. So, uh, <coughs> right. now, now, what I'd like to discuss next is what happens if, I keep turning this, if I let these particles interact with magnetic fields. So remember, electromagnetism has the electric part, which I've been talking about, and also the magnetic part. And I haven't talked about the magnetic part at all until now, so let me do that now. In that case, the rules of classical mechanics are you replace P squared. I'm non-relativistic now. I replace P by P plus A, where A is the vector potential the one form corresponding to the magnetic field, which is really a two form. Anyway, let's just think of this. Two vector fields, A and B, and B is the curl of A. Uh, and what comes in here is the square root of alpha. That's the electric charge. Now, let's do that, except the rules of quantum mechanics throw in something a little bit extraneous that you don't see classically. Namely, that th this particle, this electron, also carries with it a little magnetic moment, uh, which interacts with the magnetic field. So it's like a little uh, spinning charge. And that interaction is the magnetic field is point x times sigma. And sigma, so you should think of as being up or down. This little spin is interacting with now the whole energy, this whole kinetic energy, despite its complicated form, is in fact still a positive operator. So that much is the same as before, when we just had p squared. It's a positive operator, but it's not all that positive. It's kind of weak. So that if we consider that operator minus our friend z alpha over x, the interaction of the nucleus, so the magnetic field of the nucleus uh, we can ask what is the bottom of the spectrum of this thing that would be finite and then we can ask how does that depend on A and let's take the minimum over all possible values of the magnetic field and ask what happens well what happens is rather catastrophic this energy is finite but it goes to minus infinity as we make the field bigger and bigger like the larger squared so what we do and this is what we essentially do in quantum electrodynamics is we add the self energy of the field, which is the integral of b squared divided by a pi. And again, this thing turns out to be stable. See, we've got, we, we take minimum of, of all fields, but we add the field energy and hope to stabilize it. And this now is bounded below. If, with a condition, if a condition is satisfied, it looks like the relativistic condition we had before, namely, z times alpha squared has to be less than something. That's just a fact. This something is be between 1 and you know, 9 pi squared over 8. We don't know exactly what it is. But this problem gives you a condition, again, on uh, something involving z and something involving alpha. And as you might guess, uh, if I now consider the many-body problem, um, we will we'll get a condition on alpha itself. So uh, the moral is that a magnetic field, which you can think of as self-generated, if you want some poetry, can cause an electron to fall into the nucleus. Now, if we take many electrons and many nuclei, as I did before, but this time it's non-relativistic. Uh, in 1994, Fassman, in his unpublished work, proved stability for z equals 1 and alpha sufficiently small. It's like this common result, uh, the, the current situation which came later was that, uh, six months later, that uh, with uh, Sloss and Solovey, that if z alpha squared is less than 0.04, this is a good number, and alpha is less than 0.06, for example, z equal 1,000 and alpha equals 1 over 137, then this is stable. But again, the many body aspects tell you that you need a bound not only on z alpha squared, which is what you need for the atom, but also.
also on alpha itself. So this is non-relativistic quantum mechanics with magnetic field. So, uh, well, the, I made a remark here which just simply says that we like to have a nice big Z. Of course, Z only goes up to 92. But it's nice to have this very large number because that tells you that perturbation theory would be accurate in this context if you wanted to use it. But that's, that's neither here nor there for, uh, <coughs> for the purposes of really. Now, what happens if we take both magnetic fields and we try to make the theory relativistic? So remember, relativistic alone, without magnetic fields, requires a bound of alpha and not the alpha. Uh, magnetic fields, but non-relativistic, require a bound on alpha and z alpha squared. Now you might guess that if you do both, there's going to be in real trouble. And the answer turns out to be rather peculiar. First, I have to introduce the operator that Dirac used, because the reason Dirac shifted from the operator square to the p square plus m squared to this peculiar linear operator was that the former makes it difficult to introduce magnetic fields. And so if we want to talk about magnetic fields and mechanics, we have to use this linear, funny linear thing. Now, this operator, which is supposed to be the kinetic energy, this linear operator, uh, is kind of hopeless because it's, it itself is unbounded. So something has to be done. And what Dirac said to do, and this is sort of going, going back to primitive quantum mechanics in the Dirac era, but it's still perfectly OK, is you just don't allow the particles to get into the negative spectral subspace of that operator. So what you say is, if you denote by P plus, the projector onto the positive spectral subspace of the Dirac operator, the one particle, and lambda plus the projector onto the positive spectral subspace of all the particles, if there are many of them, then the only functions of all the variables, these n variables, if I have n particles, must satisfy lambda plus on size. Psi. So that's a condition. It's an extra condition, like having the Cowley principle of anti-symmetry or what happens. I'll put this over here, just to remind you. Now, what happens? Well, the answer is a little bit funny. Although when you think about it, it's not so funny. You can ask the question, which Dirac operator should be used to define this projector, this the positive spectral subspace? You can use either the free Dirac operator, which is the one you would get if there were no <coughs> magnetic field at all. Even though there's a magnetic field present, you use that operator. Because that's a natural operator. It's independent of whatever the field happens to be. Or another choice, uh, this, this is not being correct, and I'm really not explaining that. You know it is fine. The other choice, is to use as the definition of the positive spectral subspace in which the electron is living, the operator with the magnetic field, which is the, op the current operator that happens to be gravity. Now, the excuse for using that would be that there never is such a thing as an undressed electron. So the electron is always seen a magnetic field. You can't get away from it. So you may as well use that direct operator to define the positive spectral subspace. The answer, surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, is the following. If you take as your definition of what an electron is, is something that lives in the positive spectral subspace of the, of the free Dirac operator, then this thing is unbounded below for any z positive and sufficiently large n. You never win. You can't make a theory out of that. On the other hand, how much is n? Beg what? How much is n? Uh, what is n? Well, the I I should.
should have mentioned it and I didn't mention it. Of course, I'm going to add the field energy. So if I add the field energy and then minimize with respect to A, then I should have said that. I, sorry, I didn't. Then I can make the energy minus A. So A is indeterminate. I make A as big as I want, but I have to pay the price of the field energy. So that's what I mean when you say you don't know. On the other hand, if you take the, as defined to me by an electron, to be the positive spectral subspace of the Dirac operator with the A in it, whatever A happens to be, and if Z alpha and alpha are both small enough, then you win. That is a statement. And some numbers that we were able to produce are Z equals 56 and alpha is 1 over 137. Right? Of course, this doesn't go as far as we'd like to go, but that's as far as we can get. So the conclusion is that if you want to formulate uh, a theory of the interaction of matter with electromagnetic fields, you should include the electromagnetic field, the magnetic field in particular, as part of the definition of what you mean by a particle because you can never undress the particle. Now, unfortunately, perturbation theory, the perturbation theory that I mentioned in the very beginning that leads to all these remarkable results, the ranches and all this stuff, starts with the free Dirac operator as the basic object. It starts back here, where non-perturbatively you have to test it. What's over there? No, here. So, once more, you start the definition of the electron with the Dirac operator without that term as defining what you mean by an electron. The positive spectral subface of that Dirac operator defines the electron. And, and then you switch on the A, but you have the same definition. You have, don't change your definition, but you switch on the A. And then, non perturbatively, you'll get into that's what theorem 1 says. Theorem 2 says you can escape if provided the fine structure constants are not too big, which we all believe is, has to be the case. So you see the signs here, just indications that the current uh, theory of the interaction of matter with the electromagnetic field has certain problems built into it, and the indication is that one has to redefine the, uh, the, 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 what you mean by an electron. So that's what I mean by an incomplete theory because we haven't come to the bottom of that. Now, some recent work with Michael Ross is, is concerns the fact that the magnetic field that I've been talking about over there really should not be considered that's just a, a static uh, magnetic field that you have some classical Maxwellian electromagnetism. This field is quantized. So it itself obeys the laws of quantum mechanics. It fluctuates. Uh, <coughs> so, so far, we've seen that quantum mechanical matter with classical fields is stable if alpha and Z alpha are both small enough. Uh, the Dirac operator requires some sort of redefinition of an electron to include its self-generated magnetic field. Now, in order to have a true quantum theory, we have to quantize the fields. As I said, if you get into trouble, if you try to do this and take it too seriously, and this is, this is a problem of quantum dynamics, but it must be possible to construct such a theory because we have the world exists under us, and uh, <clears throat> we know what the, all the basic interactions have to be, all we have to do is figure out how to interpret them properly. But such a theory has to be possible, and it cannot depend on the existence of string theory or anything like that, because the world that we live in is a world of energies that are infinitesimal compared to the energies that are talked about uh, in string theory or even in nuclear physics. Okay. Uh, <coughs> actually, it's the fields themselves are not quantized. So the quantization comes through <coughs> the field energy. Uh, just as X is not quantized, but the energy in quantum mechanics of P squared.
squared plus x squared is, shows the quantization, but the x itself behaves classically. In a similar way, the magnetic field A, which is the basic uh, quantity, can be written in terms of its Fourier components in the usual way, except there's some technicalities as a polarization vector because it's a vector field, it's not just a function field, uh, just a function. Uh, traditionally, one divides by the square root of k in the definition, and these numbers are the Fourier coefficients. They're written this way because later on the field energy is going to be written in terms of the quantum mechanics comes in from the fact that the commutator of a and a dagger, a dagger is the adjunct of a, uh, is a delta. That's where the quantum mechanics comes in. <coughs> and the field energy, which is the thing that shows the quantization, uh, is now just a dagger a, which one interprets as the number of photons. That's a so-called number operator. You integrate over all the case. Now, infinities arise, as I said at the very beginning. And to get around the infinity, what you do is with all these integrals involving k, is the Fourier transform variable, you stop at some number of lambda. And you say you don't know what happens beyond that. You restore the way. Okay, so then what we really want to look at are energy differences, because those are the things we measure. And what people believe is that these energy differences should remain finite, provided, as lambda goes to infinity, provided the mass, which is a, one of the parameters in the theory, the mass of the electron, goes to zero as lambda increases. Uh, we also need a renormalization of the charge. And the, anyway, so doing this operation is called renormalization. Now, after we look at all this hocus pocus, we should miraculously get from all of this an old fashioned Schrodinger or Dirac equation. So, now, what we've done is we've built up a theory starting from the Schrodinger equation in 1996, build it up, including the interactions with magnetic fields and so on, and out should come at the end, if we do it all properly, an old fashioned Schrodinger equation for a particle that doesn't know about electromagnetic fields anymore, or electromagnetic fields, at least not the strong fields. Uh, perturbation theory, and this is my last view graph, tells us what to do. But what we have discovered already is an indication that things are not what they seem, is to go back and look at the non-relativistic case. And here we, we ask the following simple question, very simple. If we take a free particle, so there's no nuclei, just the, the simplest of all possible questions. Take a, a free particle, look at this, this operator. Look at P, which is I times the gradient, plus A of X, which is this vector field, squared, that's, the, that's uh, an operator. I'm, I'm some big chunk of space, but for one particle. Uh, there's one, one, one X and uh, A is the whole field, plus the energy of the field, which I have before, maybe I should write that down. What is the minimum of that? That is to say, what is the energy of a free particle that's sitting here all by itself, not bothering anybody? What is its energy? Its energy comes from the fact that if you try to make this zero, that is, if you try to make A zero and P zero, you have to make this guy very, very big. To make them both finite, you have to allow some A and some P. You have to pay some energy. So the minimum energy of just a free particle is not zero anymore, as it was in Schrodinger's mechanics. It will be some number. And that number will sort of be the essential energy of a particle. That's fine. Then later on, we can worry about what happens when we put in the energy like that. Now, here's what comes out. And this shows the need for non perturbative analysis. If you do perturbation theory, you'll find that the energy goes as alpha, a fine structure constant, the square of what you see in here, 
times lambda squared. Lambda is cut off. And you see this in every order of perturbation theory. That's just a fact. The truth of the matter is somewhat different, is that the, we don't know what the answer is. But we know that it's definitely less than lambda squared. It's somewhere between lambda to the 12 sevenths <coughs> and lambda to the 3 tenths. And we think it's 12 sevenths, but we're not sure about that. Uh, and this is very different from perturbation theory, but it's a fact. It's a non-perturbative result. And what's more in interesting, or what's also interesting, is the fact that if you have n such particles, obeying the Pauli principle, the bounds, the bounds we get are proportional to n. n. And if we use, we have bosons, you know, I've written it down here, we have bosons, the energy is subradial to go to square root of n. Now one thing we know is that the energy of n particles just sitting by themselves and not doing anything has to be proportional to n. In fact, strictly the energy of two, the least energy of two electrons is twice that of one electron, exactly. Um, then you just go far apart. Uh, so already, just to get a linear law uh, is a step in the right direction, but it's not the final answer. <coughs> if you do perturbation theory, well, it, it will also be n, but it will have the wrong if you have bosons, it would go to the square root of n. And again, we will show you once again that bosons really cause a problem in, in, the, in understanding uh, quantum mechanics. Now, if you go to this uh, Pauli operator, which you have non perturbative but interaction with the magnetic field, this guy, uh, it turns out, again, you would get lambda squared, but the true answer is somewhere in this. So again, it's not perturbative. Uh, for the relativistic case, if you take this, you get something proportional to n and proportional to lambda, and that's, and that's it. That's the right answer. And that's what you would get from perturbation theory. Uh, in all cases, you get something proportional to n, provided you use the power principle. So what does this add up to? It's just a small glimpse, very small glimpse, very tiny peek into the keyhole of what a non-perturbative quantum electrodynamics has to deal with, what it might look like. Uh, such a theory, as I said, must exist. We don't have it. Nobody has it. Uh, and I think uh, that will keep some people busy for something like the next 50 years. So thank you very much.